before we move into the talk, I just want to take a couple of minutes to thank two people who have made this gathering possible. First of all, Francis McClelland, who, in addition to being the, the namesake for the Francis McClelland Institute, um, was a tremendous philanthropist as well as someone who lived a life that really exemplified resilience. And she was a real staunch advocate for children, youth, and families. We're also really grateful to Pamela Turkville, who supports this colloquium series, and she is a distinguished and very generous alum of the Family and Consumer Sciences program. So we thank them. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Savannah, who's going to tell us a little bit more about our speaker for today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maggie Pitts, who is an associate professor and the director of graduate studies um, in the Department of Communication here at the University of Arizona, where she's been for 11 years. She's an expert in qualitative research methods and is an influential voice in the positive uh, communication movement. So thank you for coming. And she was one of the most responsive speakers. I got her information like very soon after. So <laughs> yeah, very thankful for her. So yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes. So, yeah we're done. We're good. Um, I know because Savannah emailed me like on the first day of my sabbatical, which was last semester, and I said, of course I can do that in January. <laughs>
And positive communication involves messages, verbal and nonverbal ways of, of communicating, of connecting with others um, that enhance our daily lived experiences. So they enhance our personal relationships. They facilitate positive institutions, for example, and generate positive emotions, right? So um, being able to have positive affect and um, all of the health and beneficial outcomes of that. Positive communication is not simply the absence of negative communication. In fact, it's not at all, right? Positive communication very much tries to show that there is a, a, a connection between a balance and harmony between positive and negative. That in order for us to feel elation and feel joy, we also have to be able to feel some of the more difficult or what we conceive of in Western um, cultures as negative emotions. But the positive side looks at what we have there to build from. So it's not the absence of negative, but it's the presence of types of communication and communication strategies that allow us to really thrive across situations. Um, and so I guess I could stop there. I have put two images of um, the first two collections on positive communication as sort of a movement in the field of communication in response to more dark side communication or a deficits-based approach to looking at family relationships, looking at personal relationships where we're focusing on on the troubles, on the problems, or maybe raising something up to um, status quo or maintaining a relationship. And what I like to say is that, you know, I maintain my car, right? <laughs> I've never enhanced my car. <laughs> I buy the cheap gas, I put in the cheap oil, whatever, but I keep it at maintenance, right? I've never souped it up. I don't want to do that in my personal relationships. I don't want to go to maintenance. I want to go to enhancement. So what are the things that make us move, help us move from good to great? And that's what we're looking at in positive communication, is moving from good to great. And there are some enactments um, of positive communication that we do in our daily lives that result in um, a wide variety of, of benefits. And I think many of these you know. So one, it generates that, those positive emotions, positive affect. Um, and works against those negative emotions. So while it allows us to enhance positive emotions, it can kind of suppress or hold at bay some of the negative emotions in, um, in the moment of positive communication. Um, looking at Fredrickson's work on the Broadman field um, theories, right? As we are able to increase these positive emotions through positive forms of talk, um, then we're able to see more, be more creative, be more accepting of messages um, that might come to us from our partner, for example. Changes how your mind works, the things that we're able to see and perceive and understand, right? Coming at something from multiple perspectives because we've generated this openness through positive affect. Uh, stress buffering, bringing out the very best in you, right? Think about, think about just feeling pleasant and how that uplifts all of us, our whole body, our face, everything, right? And as part of that, we are showing um, part of what is the best of us, right? So when we're enacting the very best communicative behaviors, we are showing the very best of us and we're putting our best foot forward. Um, helps to build personal and relational resources. This um, is something I'm going to talk about throughout the talk today, especially because this helps us build resilience, personal and relational resilience um, in later life. And um, some of you may have been here for um, my colleague Corey Floyd's talk mm -hmm. last year, I think, um, on, on affection, mm -hmm. right? And it's really nice to um, receive affection or to receive compliments. But it's also very nice to give it, right? Hence the chocolate, right? So if I give <laughs> little morsels of dark chocolate to you, don't eat them, by the way. I'll let you do that later. That's why there's two just in case. Yeah. I could also do this, say, you know, if you if you don't eat them, I'll give you three at the end, right? Um, <laughs> the idea that if I eat, so you, if you can smile, right, and I can give and I can bring joy to this, you're all now smiling at me too, which makes me feel really good, right? And so now I feel like I'm doing a good job because you're happy about the chocolate, but all of that reverberates, right? That kindness, that generosity, that pleasantness, 
kind of um, changes the vibration within this room, and I as a speaker and you as listeners then have um, a sort of an extra ability to hopefully be in the moment and for me to feel like everything's going just fine. So what are some of the types of positive communication that we might engage in on a daily, um, on a daily basis? Asking what's going right. Imagine, again, walking into your physician for your annual exam, right? And your physician says, hey, what's going right for you today? It's really a, a conversation turner, right? Or anybody, really. It doesn't have to be your physician. I think I've just got that on my mind because I really do need to get better. <laughs> Modeling happiness, right? So that we show we don't have to fake it till you make it. If you're feeling happy, though, it's okay to show that and to show, to show pleasure. And when you do that, I think especially in a family context, you know, with with my children, right? It helps them to show this is a time where we can be playful, we can be happy, and so we can model some of these these behaviors. Recognizing achievements in our colleagues, in our um, in our families, large and small, giving compliments, greeting people authentically. Right? Think about that when we say somebody's name, how that builds relationship with somebody. Um, when we ask them how they are, and we wait to listen how they are. Uh, disclosing, sharing information about yourself, um, sharing and celebration. There's a lot of research that says um, we know a lot about social support and the importance of social support and how I might be able to give support um, in a time of need, but we know a little bit less about how something great happened to me and I want to share it with you, but I don't know how you're going to receive it. And so one thing we know about sharing and celebration and celebratory support is that that's a mega enhancer, right? So I feel good shared an achievement with you and you have now um, celebrated that with me. Maybe you'll say something and maybe you'll say we should go out and have a cupcake or you know, dark chocolate or whatever it is. Um, expressing gratitude and thank you for inviting me here. Listening generously, not so much critically, right? Listen assuming that the person has their best intentions in mind. Sometimes they don't, right? But if we can, if we can come at it from the perspective that maybe they actually have my very best intentions when they're saying these things. Um, offering forgiveness. And then what I'm bringing to you today is the idea of savoring. And savoring interaction, savoring communication and relational moments that might enable us to start um, bottling up good experiences so that we can release them when we need them later. I think savoring is kind of uh, a fun topic, but it's not just mine. So um, I want to bring it into the field of positive communication, but it is a positive psych construct. And so um, Brian and Vera have done the majority of work there. I've talked about savoring as a person's capacity to attend to, to elevate, to enhance, to generate that positive effect, affect um, of the different experiences in one's life, right? And they talk a lot about the sensory experiences. So. We may be able to savor dark chocolate, and what would that experience taste like? Or a sunset, or this beautiful, beautiful view that you have here in this room. So we can savor the sensory experiences, and I think that's what many of us think of when we think about savoring food. Um, but we can also savor relational experiences and communicative experiences. Um, and so I want to point to the work also of David Spara and his colleagues. He's in the psych department here, <laughs> um, who works on relational savoring. So part of that, looking at um, marital and uh, divorced uh, partners, but also looking at um, relationships across distance and so forth. And so he comes at it from, sort of this, again, this psychological perspective, but looking at relationships. Um, savoring an experience at the same time um, with somebody you're emotionally close to. So I want to move relatively quickly through the um, psychology of savoring, but this will give you sort of a background notion for how I got to be where I am in my own, in my own research. Um, so savoring, I think I'll start here with this idea of the time dimensions. We can savor and have these experiences of intense pleasure that we want to capture. So it's different from mindfulness or meditation, right, where the idea is neutral recognition of what's happening around you, but you're not trying to capture it, you're trying to let it go, right? And um, you're not supposed to give a balance. But this is really hard for me. So here's what I like to do. I like to see something good coming, and then I want to capture it, and then I 
like to carry it around with me for a while and put it in my pocket. This is what savoring means, right? So it allows you to be present, you have to be mindful. The pleasant experience is coming, pleasant affect, I recognize it, I like it, I like that I'm liking it. There's a metacognitive approach here. I can't just like it, but I have to think, oh, I'm liking this, I'm liking that I like it. And at that point, you're savoring. So it takes a lot of cognition to do, and you can savor in the present moment, so I can savor something right now. But I can also think about savoring uh, through reminiscence. I savor in the past. I can also anticipatorily savor something in the future, like those cookies, right? <laughs> right? Or having a um, great conversation at the conclusion of this talk. So the time orientations of savoring allows me to transcend present moment to go and pick something up from the past that was particularly joyful if I need it right now, maybe it's not a great moment, or to leap into the future and think, okay, so this isn't the best moment, but at 4 o'clock, true story, I'm having tea with my mom at 4 o'clock. She wanted to come to the talk, but I said, no, mom's in the house. Okay. So <laughs> I'm meeting her at 4. I'm meeting her at 4. Um, moms so, are always allowed. I know, actually, I'm always allowed. Personally, when you share um, a savor moment with a person that you, um, that you like, there are lots of positive outcomes of savoring. So here are just a few good body of research in psychology again, positive affect, happiness or subjective well-being, life satisfaction, um, personal rela relational resilience, and some decreased negative um, stuff, depression. And then they looked at specialized populations, particularly among older adults, um, looking again at uh, the more savoring you have, the greater life satisfaction, but also reduced chronic pain, um, depression, um, greater resilience, and then among specialized populations of people who are, uh, who are ill. And uh, savoring helps not only the caregiver, which is something that I'm very interested in, um, but also for the person who is dealing, in this case, um, with cancer, um, cancer treatments and recovery, and the savoring helps them to um, reduce some of the pain and increase psychological resilience. Some of the more recent research, um, really recent, <coughs> still online only, looks at adaptive um, family functioning, for example. So if you have a, um, a well-functioning family, and if you do, like, I think that sounds really cool. Um, <laughs> What are, what, are, what are the parts that, that allow that to run? But if it's adaptive family functioning, this is in, um, in Hong Kong in particular, but with uh, college-age students, and that was um, correlated with positive, um, savoring positive experiences, which also led to lower depressive symptoms and greater life satisfaction for the whole family, but especially for the emerging adult. So that sort of new um, off the presses, you know, research. And then other ones um, looking at um, savoring positive communication at the end of life, for example, right? And so end of life conversations seem like they're really daunting, but if you've been strong enough to be able to read the research on end of life communication, um, there's some beautiful, meaningful moments that people engage in and savor in that moment. And so some, some recent research on that. So I was looking at the sort of psychological dimensions and thinking, okay, so this does help bolster people's uh, lived experiences. But then it made me question, all right, well, can we make this a, can, can I turn it into something that I'm allowed to study within my department, right? Because I can't <laughs> study uh, psychology. So, I just put the word
word communication in there and decided to ask the question. <clears throat> if you don't know me, I am um, I'm a qualitative researcher. I do ethnography. I do phenomenology. Um, I go in and want to like extract you know sensible story souls out of your lives. Um, and so this is how I approach this um, this study. And um, I've been very fortunate to um, work with a um, my research team here um, on campus and have. Um, I'm happy that the first topology, the first step in the model, has just um, just appeared online only. So that's out, and we've got a chapter in the Rutledge Handbook called Positive Communication. So I'm trying to connect this idea of savoring um, to positive communication and have this sort of research trajectory now going forward with, um, again, with my research team. Elite J in the back is one of the members of my of, um, research team, and having been presenting it at various um, national and international conferences um, over the last year and a half or so. And so what have I found? Well, I, I started by trying to identify what are the types. First of all, do people savor communication? That's actually the first question I asked. It turns out that if we had time and I sat and I asked each of you, is there a moment in your life that you can recall that gives you pleasure when you think about when you were communicating with somebody or you were in the presence of communicators, right? Can you recall that for me? And everybody could. There wasn't a case where somebody could say, nope, I never can savor on communication. And they savor really interesting things, like the sound of certain words spoken by certain people, right? The beautiful sound of things. But also, I mean, here's the one that, you know, at the time my, you know, boyfriend would have said, I love you, right? And so it's things that we can think of, oh yeah, that would be a savory, um, communication moment, but also things like, I love the way that my oldest son said Millennium Falcon, which was Lemony Falcon, right? And so, like, you, I, like I treasure that. And so it's a communicative moment for me that I kind of delight in. And if it's a bad day, I think of Lemony Falcon, like, mm, that's nice. <laughs> so there's an intrapersonal component, right? Because I can think, I can imagine, I can recall these communicative moments that give me pleasure, and also an interpersonal uh, dimension, which it, which um, furthers it, it chains the savoring. So if I tell you I'm savoring, I'm savoring this moment right now, and you say I too. That's great. And then we start thinking about remember that other time we savored? Oh yeah, that was pretty good. So you can start <laughs> savoring and chaining um, to the present and to the past. And so, um, I'm going to show you some of the dimensions of communicative savoring on the next slide, but I'm going to cheat and give you the definition that the working definition of this new construct of communication. Uh, the process of mindfully, remember that idea of mindful, that I'm, I'm paying attention, but now I'm capturing it. Uh, attending to pleasurable or meaningful. That's all me, and I'll tell you why the meaningful I think is very important. Social interaction in real present moment, remembered or anticipated, imagined encounters, and enhancing or prolonging the positive affect. We'll never get to everything I want to say, so I'm going to give you the shortcut here. Across cultures, people savor things differently. In the U.S., we like to have this sort of bar of positive emotions. Let's stay up here in this land. Negative emotions, they don't exist. Stay out of those, right? That's bad. In other places, uh, there's not so much this line, right? They are in harmony, in balance with one another, and those negative experiences are meaningful as our positive experiences. So while we talk a lot about attending to the pleasurable experiences and capitalizing on those, I think we need to talk more about attending to meaningful experiences, which include things like um, grief and sharing grief, end of life communication, difficult encounters with people, caregiving encounters, um, caregiving people who have speech aphasia and have a hard time communicating with you, people who have different forms of dementia, and how difficult that is in a caregiving sense. So bringing, savoring, and recognizing the meaningfulness in that moment may help us to relieve some caregiver group as well. I think they're really, aside from the fun, uh, good feelings. I think they're really important practical implications of bringing in this regret. So I did a um, first investigation was with 68, I'm thinking, participants. Um, asking 
for them to write rich narratives about a time that they experienced communication savoring, and I did not define it for them because I hadn't come up with the definition. <coughs> so in this type of research, you really allow, did a phenomenology, so I was looking at it both from a constructivist grounded theory approach, we already have some extant theory knowing what's happening, I want to build from what, what we don't know yet about communication experiences and build this all together. Um, and they get a sense phenomenologically what it feels like. What does savoring feel like? It feels different for different people, but it is an enhanced embodied experience. A kind of bubbles or a kind of, um, uh, you know, a little bit of electricity or soft fuzzy or what, you know, whatever that feeling was. And what I found were that there were seven types of communication encounters that people tended to, um, they gravitated toward uh, for communication experiences that they particularly savored, relished in. Luxurious. Aesthetic communication, which gets the sense of um, kind of a, a perfect communication moment and the way words sound, or I gave a public speech and it hit everybody just right, or I delivered a speech at a wedding and I made everybody cry. But, you know, there's all kinds of moments here where the prettiness, the fineness, the poetry of language of communication um, create that aesthetic moment. Communication presence, this is like when you're really in it with somebody. It's kind of like flow, right? But nothing else matters. So remember in seventh grade, talking on the phone, talking on the phone, all night long, right? Time is going by, you don't know anything else except for you're like really in the moment with that person, right? And so that's the sort of communication presence absorbing the moment and pushing other things out. A nonverbal communication with things like, and here's, here's one that I think of, think of the difficult side is somebody giving you a health diagnosis or telling you that your grandmother is going to die, these are real examples, but doing it in a way that showed compassion, the hand, gentle hand touch, the way that the voice changed, the closeness, the changing of the physical environment, that that nonverbal element was very expressive and meaningful and they clung on to that. Uh, recognition and acknowledgement, a lot of examples here about savoring the moment when somebody's achievements were recognized or when I was able to say to somebody, that was great. I'm so, and, and you see, especially the children, they kind of bright up. We have got to turn those lights on more often for people in relationships with us. Uh, relational communication, um, these are kind of turning points in relationships. For the most part, these moved relationships closer, but not always. It was a time that I understood that we were only going to be friends and never romantic partners. And that clarity was so important, and I got it, right, that that's a moment that they can they can recognize the, the transition, though not the way they wanted of the relationship. So I just changed this one, actually, so Lichie is probably going to say, what? Um, because this is normally extraordinary communication, but in the, the research that we're looking at now, so the you know, live data that's coming toward us, um, tells us that extraordinary communication, these rare and novel moments, are things that people savor, but also the fact that every Sunday I have coffee with my grandmother, um, and we say the same thing, and there's something in that ordinary ritual communication, or routine communication that becomes sort of ritualized, and how important that is for us. So this one's changing, these are all changing as it's relatively new. Here's a hard one for communication scholars, I think, to wrap their head around, um, because here I'm talking about communication that's not communication, right? So it's the idea that I can look at you and I think that we're having the same experience at the same time, but I don't have to say it out loud. In fact, if I do say it out loud, we're gonna lose the magic. So it's implicitly shared, like I know that you know that I know, we're totally saying it. <laughs> Apparently this happens a lot on spring break. <laughs> uh, so, is this real? I find this tip typology um, through uh, qualitative um, coding, phonetic coding, and then we have to decide, okay, is this really out there? So does secondary follow-up study with 125 narratives compared to the original 65, we start to see um, the same patterns re-emerging, so we did both a priori coding as well as emergent coding, um, looking at possibly two new uh, codes emerging. This is really kind of, we're doing this now, so I don't know how I feel about it quite yet. I think routine encounters are going to move up here to um, extraordinary. 
and then we'll see about, about personal growth. But that, to me, I think is going to fall under acknowledgement. Um, but you can see that in, in both data sets, there was some presence, although implicit communication um, keeps sort of falling down a little bit. So I, it's also probably hard to write about it in a, in a minute. Let's see, does this say, so this asks also, like, what kind of relationships are you likely to savor? So people are savoring uh, communication within family, romantic, and friend relationships. Less common, but also their shared social context, like a crowd um, participating in a um, pep rally or something like that. Um, mentors and celebrities. So let me tell you a little bit about the phenomenology of savoring and what that experience looks like. This, this is the part that kind of allows you to um, really get your teeth, I think, in the experience. And so I'm going to categorize this into four different ways. One is Presence and mindfulness, right? So people have a heightened awareness of what's going on in the moment. And they talk about having raw nerves, like their nerves are open to the external information and everything is elevated. Um, the other one is a sort of reflective awareness, that they have an awareness in the moment that something special is happening or some or they anticipated or, or did happen. This sort of real reflective awareness. Frequent replay. Um, is one of the ways that people know that they've savored, right? So we might not savor a moment in the moment because we're so in the moment we can't savor it. <laughs> but we can savor it later. I can't savor this moment because I've got too much going on cognitively, right? But later, I'm just saying, I savored that moment, right? So I can't do it now because my mind's busy. Um, but we may replay it then and try to get into all the good parts. And you can, in your mind, right? You're fast forwarding, you're getting just right to the part where um, Charlie opens the chocolate and it's got the golden ticket. It's the best part. Of um, and vivid embodied recall. So, if you have any leaning for quality of research, you like the juicy parts. So here's some juicy parts. Um, how do we know? How do I know what that phenomenology, what, what is that physical, that embodied experience of savor? Uh, if I'm savoring a communication moment, it's like my entire body is full of love. There's nothing I can think of that can possibly take away the joy that I feel. Wow. Let's get to that. <laughs> that sounds good. This is my favorite quote. I think this is, this is really important in terms of thinking about resilience. Um, and she's saying, I, I thought in my head and then I said it out loud. So savoring is really this sort of communicative event anyway, right? Because you're thinking, I am savoring. I want to remember this moment forever and bottle it up forever so that on days when I feel sad or discouraged, I can shove it back into my soul, right? These are, um, these are undergraduate students with this idea that I can be in this moment now so that when I need it later, I'm just going to put it right back in my soul. Uh, here's another one that um, sort of talks about being um, wanting to use that later, so it's savoring now future intent. I want to look back at it. This is um, um, an end-of-life conversation with the grandmother. I want to make sure, I, I knew in that moment that I wanted to make sure everything was perfect so that I could always look back and say, that was a great, um, as perfect as a moment as possible. And I look back on it and smile. Other descriptions of how it feels, right? Something as if when you wake up from a dream, I think many of us have had that experience, like, oh, there's something really good in that dream. You kind of want to go back to it. Um, and you play it over and over in your head so you don't forget it. And they also talk about never getting, always wanting to do that. They never get bored with playing it over and over again. Um, often reliving, um, reliving it and then this embodied experience. Then when I think of that moment, I have the same feelings now that I did then. And that's sort of the quintessential experience of savoring. So these are kind of the no duh findings, but I think they're fun. No duh in the sense that the psychology of savoring finds sort of the same thing. It's just that they're not focused on messages. So why I think these are really interesting is because it allows us to focus on these relational and social encounters and interactions that tell us these are meaningful to people and they hold on to them uh, and they're, uh, they generate that positive impact. Um, but in terms of the phenomenology or the physical experience or the psychological experience, they really look the same perhaps with more meaning, but the experience is the same as being very out of control. Anything excited about that? Anticipating. 
Uh, so what are some of the theoretical implications? All right, so what am I doing here? This is not my theory. This is probably like not the thing that you're supposed to do. Uh, but in grounded theory, in constructivist grounded theory, you don't just have to try to create something that has nothing that's never been there before. As I started building um, toward a model of communication savoring and looking at what does that look like, what's the experience, what are the contexts, who is it happening with, what are the outcomes, and I started placing it within the context of one example, the Brodman Build um, theories, but also um, Tammy and Katie, she's a, um, a professor at UC Santa Barbara, uh, theory of resilience and relational load. In particular, looking right here, I'm going to tell you something, and don't shh. I think communication scholars very rarely study actual communication. I like to talk. I'm probably nosy. So when Tammy says that she's studying communal orientation, um, and communication maintenance behaviors, lots of times those are just psychological measurements, but they're not actually measuring talk. So I'm excited because I think that we can look at savoring here and we can map onto her model and see how this can decrease relational load and increase relational resilience. So when we have interpersonal communication savoring, or savoring within relationships, then that allows I share a moment with you that allows me to build toward my relationship to create this sense of we, a communal orientation. We've experienced this together. Let's talk about how we're savoring it, or let me share a savored experience with you. And that creates a bond. At the same time, we can use communication savoring as a way of maintaining, or my words, enhancing relationships, right? Because we can say, you know what, maybe we're going through turbulence, this is a rough time. Can we draw from something from our relational bank or my personal bank and bring that in so that we, we remind ourselves of when we were thriving? We remind ourselves or we project in the future, here's where we're going to. And right now, we're in the rough part of the river, but we're moving forward. So the first step there is, this is a study in, uh, in progress with Dr. Gary Beck, who's at Old Dominion University, where I was before, um, which looks at the communication pathways. They told me not to say communication savoring since nobody knows what it is. Communication pathways, yes. I mean, yeah, they will know what it is very soon. You all know what it is. Uh, toward relational resilience among military families. And what we're doing is sort of testing, testing this model and looking to see if um, relationships uh, who savor higher capacity to savor more ways of savoring communication and relationships does increase perception of relational satisfaction, perceptions of relational resilience, um, reduced relational stress or relational load. So, um, so we're, we're testing this right now with military families, looking at the spouse who is non-deployed within the context of, of re-entry. Uh, another line of my research looks at re-entry adaptation and adjustment. So this is one place where those kind of bridge to me. Um, and has really, um, to me, is very important in terms of um, helping a population that can be, in some ways, vulnerable, right? Incredibly mm -hmm. resilient population. But re-entry makes military families very um, vulnerable. So we're looking at the ABCDs of this. Um, this is the last acronym that we have to take. But what, what savoring, um, this is what we're predicting, is that people who do the savoring are able to access, access their past positive um, experiences and build positive communication repertoires, right? Because the more you do this and the more you practice the positive communication, the more you have those repertoires to draw from in times of need. Create a hopeful, hopeful future by engaging in this um, anticipatory savoring and drawing together, right? Showing the moments, looking at a history of these are the moments where that we saved or the this connection. Um, and there's a history of, of work here as well. Even again, David Sparrow, who does the work on um, savoring, has looked at both long distance savoring as it relates to relational resilience among long distance company, uh, long distance partners mm -hmm. and military spouses. <clears throat> Two other studies that are in progress right now um, have to do with sort of testing the boundaries of communication savoring. So one is looking at generational differences. Um, savoring is a developmental um, you know, phenomenon. 
Right? So as we, as we age and we have more experiences and we're able to attend to them in different ways and broaden our horizons, right, we can gather experiences in new ways. There's no end to our limit to identify meaningful moments, positive moments to savor. And so it's really beneficial um, across the lifespan. So what we're looking at, most of the research has, um, has not looked at young children and then hasn't looked at older adults, right? So it's mostly within um, uh, emerging adults or young adults, and then a little bit in older adulthood and much less in, um, in, in youth. So um, we should look at So we use, uh, for example, socio-emotional selectivity theory to try to um, predict and understand whether or not there would be differences in terms of savoring across generations. And um, to do that, we collected um, hmm, also rich, detailed narratives. I think the number is going to come up probably in a minute, but 120, 187 maybe on that one-ish uh, narratives. And, um, and actually, under the direction of Jennifer uh, Stephen Mowbray, who's here, um, did a content analysis. When my students did a content analysis of these, these types that older adults um, say for us compared to children, and then we're doing a more qualitative um, uh, approach currently. No difference in terms of the types. So the emerging adults and the older adults had almost similar frequencies of the same types of communication savoring. Um, they both tended to savor relationships within, or savor moments within families of the highest. Although older adults had a broader range of um, relationships in which they savor, which is a little bit counterintuitive because socio-emotional selectivity theory would say that they would savor those that are most meaningful to them and usually closer, but they have other examples across the board. Whereas younger adults then tended to savor um, friendships. So the relational contexts, um, some more preliminary findings there. Um, looking at, there's some more of a media presence, and this is not something that I was looking for um, initially, and then it just, it, it really became apparent, right, that we can save our moments, and this is, again, counterintuitive to me, but it starts to make sense, that one is about funny cat videos, and I thought, oh, really, like, is this serious? Yeah, like, we're watching a funny cat video, right, and it's like, okay, the funny cat video is funny, but, like, we're enjoying it together, and we're bonding and communicating across this. So the media have, um, new social media have um, influence in ways that I hadn't considered before. So there's more of a media presence in the savoring communication experiences among the younger set. Um, whereas the older adults set um, is really safe. So the data is much richer. Um, the word length, these are actually significant. So the word length, uh, average word length for older adults, 253, but it was going up into the thousands for older adults, right? Um, whereas for for the younger adults, really there wasn't such uh, variation in, um, in word length. Mm -hmm. Much more descriptive detail and greater focus. So younger adults were maybe telling me about one or two experiences or kind of flitting around experiences, whereas the older adults were going real deep into one. Let me give you this is the gift of qualitative research. They're giving me the gift of their story, right? Like, here's somebody who wants to hear the story, and they might appreciate it in a way that I do. Um, and we do. We bond as a research team over the deliciousness of these things. Um, and also time span. Now, this makes sense, right? But the younger adults reported an average of, I had this impactful savory experience about two years ago, whereas older adults were pulling, on average, about 13 years back. Um, so there were some differences in, in time span as well. The other element is the cultural element. And so I have an international, I have an international research team, which gives me lots and lots of delight. And part of my, I think I talk, told you that part of my research is on uh, sort of re-entry, I look at intercultural and international adjustment and re-entry. So we've also been looking at this in terms of a, a cultural phenomenon. And I think um, in terms of shaping sort of the philosophy behind us and the movement in both psychology and in communication, looking at the broader um, implications uh, culturally, right, in terms of 
positive and negative um, emotions. So the study that we're, um, this is harder, this has been slower. We've had a harder time getting our international um, sample, but when we get them, they say wonderful things. Uh, Examining the role of language and culture in um, the expression of savory and the experience of savory. Western ideals of hedonic pleasure, right? Like, let's amplify the positive, let's go positive, stay above that line all the time, and really reduce the negative. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I think that there are experiences that fall below that line. We've got to start finding meaningful and engaging and holding those in our heart in a way that's similar to it. it's taking care of them, not ruminating, but savoring difficult experiences. And indeed, this happens in some of um, the more Eastern. Cultures. So those Eastern ideals of emotional balance, regulating positive and negative. So in this idea, it's like, ooh, ooh, if it's getting too good, right? There's no end of our too good, right? In the U.S., we want to go like beyond. There's no glass ceiling, right? We're just going to keep going. However, in other cultures, right, with the negative, we don't want to go at all. In Eastern cultures, we want um, we want them to stay a little bit closer together. So whereas we might be able to embrace more of that negative emotion or meaningful experiences that come out of challenging encounters, we don't want them to go too low, but we also don't want them to go too high. So there's an upregulation and a dampening effect that's more active in Eastern cultures that allows me to appreciate the beauty and the meaning in, in both of these things, but not let it get out of control. Um, so we're looking at these cultural differences, um, and some of the preliminary results are things like, well, what kinds of who, with whom, what types of experiences communicatively um, happen across cultures that we haven't captured in our, in our um, American set. Uh, religious teachers emerged as a very frequent, like this is a person with whom I've savored communication with others, elders. Um, really savoring the language, right, that we don't have, our language, English is very functional, for the, especially the type of culture that we have. But there are languages in which we can say something like te quiero or te amo, and these mean something very different, and it's it's meaningful in that way, and you can play in that beauty of language that we may not have if we only have access to one language. Um, moving beyond, so I have that implicitly shared, but here it's sort of collectively shared, right? Like if I'm savoring something, my family might be able to savor it. So the extension of me to the we was more present in the cultural. And of course, um, examples from uh, people who have participated in this study about savoring difficult life circumstances and savoring communicating about those. Right? Examples of being um, having to serve time in the military, for example, how difficult that is. <clears throat> I had to copy and paste the, I couldn't, I don't know how many changes characters. So the top one looks like I, you know, stole it from the internet or something. I didn't. I just stole it from my student because I can't figure out how to get it in. The green copy doesn't find. Um, so we also asked people to tell us in their own language what does savoring mean? Um, and are there different words for this experience? And you get a lot of food stuff, but then but that's not really what we're going for. But we can smell, taste, appetite, or a preference to prefer, to especially like, or to focus. Um, an unforgettable memory, a specific period in the lifespan. Um, in Korea, we began to get savory food, but then enjoying at most, right? We're getting a lot of this capitalization. Um, in Czech, ex enjoying the experience. These are different, I mean, it's kind of neat. Like, what's the difference between these? Yeah. So I speak Czech. Jivat is uh, that root word for those first two means to live. Right. So, I mean, I didn't translate, obviously, I just got it from our Czech speaker, but this idea to live, right? I mean, does this resonate with your, with your, I mean, that doesn't sound um, like a mistranslation in the sense that to, yeah, to that, live, right? Like to really have that experience, to enjoy the experience, or let it be inscribed in my mind. Again, these were things that participants Shared if we were let, letting an experience breathe. I just think these are beautiful ways of, of thinking about what this means. Um, or, uh, take all the juice out of something, like, really, you're like squeezing out the goodness. I think this is 
Uh, anyway, we found that there are some differences in terms of language, but if your language tells you you can squeeze all the juice out of something, then you can do it, right? Because our language gives us that. All right. Okay. So this is not a real model; it's fake, which sort of follow my follow my theory here. Okay. So um, I'm presenting you a little bit of data that I found this construct. I've labeled it. Thank goodness, right? And now I'm starting to test it, see how it maps onto other theories, but also um, looking at ways that we can expand this notion. And so this is how I kind of break it down visually. We start with this idea of mindfulness. Right? And so when we increase that mindfulness, we increase the awareness that we have of moments that are pleasant and or meaningful. So if we attend to as things are going by in our little zen flow, right, something good comes, and we raise that little flag that something good is here, let me attend to it, let me, let me enjoy this thing, um, that allows us to savor. Once we start savoring, we intensify or amplify that experience, we try to prolong it, and then this allows us to do a couple things. One is, in that moment, we feel greater positive affect. Um, and that's good for a health and well -being. Hard to argue that, right? Decreased stress, increased positive affect. It also can lead to interpersonal chaining, which leads to those anticipatory and reminiscent types of savoring. That's sort of a do loop there of more and more good stuff happening to me. Okay, but that's not all. As we have increased awareness of what's happening and we're savoring in the moment, we're also doing memory building. Because if I'm hyper aware in a moment, then I'm able to get that to stick in my memory in vivid detail that I can recall when needed later, later, which then gives me a bank of positive emotions and positive moments to draw from, either personally or relationally. And then all of these kind of lead to um, relational resilience, also personal psychological resilience, but from a family and um, romantic relationships perspective, the interpersonal element, getting to that ability for relationships to adapt positively um, to adverse events or life stressors, and return, and this is sort of Tammy Afidi's words, to return to that state of relational well-being, which is, I think, good, but I also think at this moment we can start elevating and um, enhancing those relationships. Okay, so in the rapid quickness, in case my mom didn't have it, she didn't have it. Just like super pictures, right? So how to savor. Here's the part that you get to do. Um, I'm cute, right? Okay, so this is my this is my son. So step one, identify pleasure. These are pleasurable experiences. One like this is like, you know, one of his early baths in his first little bathroom. Like how cute is that? Step one. Mm -hmm. uh, do we click the button? No. And then step two, enhance the pleasure. Uh, th these are mine. This comes from Bryant and Durop again. Sensory perceptual sharpening. Oh, you could start thinking about this now, right? So these are things like all of those senses. I don't know if you like Hershey's Kisses, but have you ever thought about like the, the tin foil? Okay, that's the sound, right? You've got everything right here, but if you just focused on the feeling and the touch of it, like this is kind of, um, you know, wrinkly, but inside, you know what that feels like in your brain. You can imagine what it's going to taste like. Wheels and your tongue glides over the smoothness of the chocolate. Anyway, that's sensory perception sharpening, where you can smell that, you can taste it, you can hear <coughs> the sound. Oh, that's probably good. Um, I think of that as a road luxuriating behavioral expression, right? That like cute little like totally happy smile. All right, and then there's like our first plum. So. Cute. Um, absorption and temporal awareness, the fleetingness, right? For me, looking at these, like, oh, I have, like, that, that thing, that cute thing, that's nine years old now. Different, cute, different. Um, not eating cute, right? And so absorption and temporal awareness, like, everything is fleeting, right? So nothing is permanent. So we can find joy in, in the not permanent of something. Um, and the absorption is being just completely kind of enthralled with something in rapture. Right, and so you can be absorbed in that moment. And that's that sort of present sense. And this is a picture, this is October. This is my grandfather who turned 90. This is his 90th birthday. And uh, my two sons and me, and then that's a cousin and her kid, but a big family drove, drove in a car from here to Ohio and Kentucky uh, to have that celebration. 
And so that's the idea of sharing um, with others. So we can enhance savoring, um, enhance this positive affect by sharing our experiences with others by communicating. Counting blessings is sort of the, the gratitude count. Memory building, really acting. Heard uh, one of the um, participants say, I thought to myself, I want to save this in my memory forever, right? So I shove it back into my soul. That's really active memory building. And that's a neat thing to do. It's like, oh, let me put that in there so I can pull it out later when I need it. And one of the things that my research team and I are finding now uh, are these intrapersonal. Interpersonal cues of savor, sort of like sharing with others, and saying, you should really savor this moment because this is a great moment, so like, let's savor it. But intrapersonal cues allow you to do that within yourself. Man, this moment is fleeting. I really want to savor it. And the way you start doing that is by grabbing onto other things, right? So you can focus on one positive element, element and that allows you to start seeing the other ones. So this is how you can savor. It's now, of course, your turn to say that. So you are welcome. Then take the one that's special that been sitting in the sunshine. They'll be like fun too. You're welcome now to savor your dark chocolate, which has its own health benefits. And while I, while I've, uh, you know, tied your tongue up with chocolate, I'm going to invite you to ask me questions. So thank you. Please ask me any questions and share your experience. Yeah, so Mary, that was a great talk. I liked it a lot. And I really appreciate your enthusiasm and positivity. And now I'm going to play that with that again. Okay? Thanks. So, like, say I'm Melissa Burnett, and I'm like, what about all these people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged? Like, for example, if I'm facing like eviction and I'm worried about like where my kids are going to live tonight, do I really have like cognitive capacity to think about savoring? No. Or, so does that mean that like not that this is like a bad idea, but then is it like limited in terms of who can experience it? Or also no. So how about this? Okay. When when any of us are under stress and duress, right? I'm thinking about um, maybe my own. Um, my own identity is under threat, or my security and my family's security mm -hmm. is under threat when I'm dealing with these things. I can't. I don't have the cognitive capacity to save her, so in that moment, no. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that you you also may be a person who has high capacity to save her. So we have an inclination towards savoring, and we can build that. So savoring is cool because it's a skill that we can learn and we can build, but we cannot sit in the moment where I'm getting evicted and all these things are happening, or everybody's yelling at the dinner table or whatever it is, and right. think, oh, I'm going to say it right now, it's not going to work. Right. So it's not going to come in and save you. That being said, um, I mean, you know, like with the happiness studies and also sort of high savoring places are places that have less, right? Mm -hmm. And so being, having a lack of resources, the way that we think of lack of material items, um, living paycheck to paycheck, that does not prevent you from, from savoring. In fact, the, the fleetingness and the appreciation of what you have and what is going right in that moment may contribute to the resilience that is necessary and works within those families. So although, yes, in that moment, the savoring is not going to happen. And, and you can't, you know, people look at me like, I'm not saving this moment. I'm like, I'm not either, because you're stressing me out, right? But um, we, can come, we can come back and we can, we can time travel through savoring in ways that I think are important, especially during times of children. So I don't, I, I think that it is, there is the potential um, for anybody to be able to savor. And we know that people, when people do, and savoring doesn't, isn't lasting like a whole day. Probably like if you were in meditation, maybe you could like savor all day, like you could meditate all day. I'm like 30 seconds, good, right? But um, as you can sort of bring that in and identify things that are going right, we have, we still have this, we have our family, or we have these, um, um, there's this idea of memorable messages, for example, mm -hmm. right, so like, one, you know, my mom will say, well, our family is really, res very resilient, or whatever it is, and that comes to me in a time of need. That's not to say that all memorable messages are one that we savor, mm -hmm. but it might become something we savor, because mm -hmm. that message comes to me in a time of need, and I can um, find what's going right. So then I have another question, just quote I'm just going to answer my question. So my next question is, again, thinking about Melissa Barnett's student at 11 here, 
So how about, like, do you think it's just, like, personality-driven? Like, do you think just people who are higher on openness and or agreeableness, like, they're just more likely to favor versus, like, people who are neurotic because they're spending all their time ruminating and being terrible relational partners for the close relationships class? Like, do you think it's, like, personality-driven? There, yeah, I mean, so if you mapped Saber and onto the Big Five, you're yeah. going to see some interesting. You're going to see some interesting overlaps, right? But um, neuroticism isn't going to isn't going to say that you can't savor, right? It might, mm -hmm. but that might also lead to more rumination, right? And so rumination kind of the opposite of it's the dark side of savor. It's sort of what you don't want to do, right? right. Um, so if you can ruminate, you can you can savor, and that has to do with optimism, right? So which which way are you kind of dealing? Because, like, and again, Adam would know more about this than me, but I think about, like, those couples who are in crisis. Mm -hmm. And then, like, one of the things that, like, a counselor is really important in doing is, like, breaking those chains of, like, really negative communication patterns or, you know, whatever the correct language is. So I could see how, like, during therapy, they would, they would be told to start savoring, but then be like, then I remember that really negative thing you did yesterday. Like, I could see how, like, that could start and then, like, decrease quickly into, like, negativity and rumination. And, and again, I don't know if that's true. Yeah, yeah. But I could see that happening. Yeah, I think you know it's an empirical question. So some some of the some of the research that I've seen, especially on couples in turbulent times, right? They also look at attachment. Yeah. So securely attached people who also have capacity mm -hmm. to savor. I know, right? Um, all that tends to go good, good, good. Insecurely attached, right? Ambivalence. That kind of leads to. Um, I'm missing savoring. We're not saying we should be savoring, right? And then that goes into a negative spiral because, <laughs> oh my yeah. God, I'm supposed to savor, and in my relationship, we're not savoring. So, so. Don't have to worry about that we're not savoring. Like, yeah. I, can, I can bring that up during the next session, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I wish I could come in and say that. If you just savor every day, you know, you're you're like you're better off, right? But what I'm telling you is this, Melissa. What I'm saying is, <laughs> our theories don't account for what's going right. We're never looking at how to to generate more of the good stuff. We're looking at how to stave off the bad stuff, or we're looking at understanding what's happening within that, maybe bringing us back up to normal. But we're not really looking at oh, what what is keeping this this couple um, staying together, resilient, getting better and better, you know, falling more in love every year, right? Our families where where things actually do get better. And it's not because there's an intervention, right? It's because they have they have created, I mean, they can be out interventions also help, right? But they've created patterns maybe of, of resilience and positive communication that allow them to have those repertoires that go forward. We have one more question. So that point I think is really interesting. So like think about the work by Eli Finkel, right? My favorite Eli Finkel paper of all time is climbing Man Mount Maslow without enough oxygen. Mm -hmm. Basically, he has this suffocation hypothesis where he says we expect too much from our relational slash marital partners, and actually having too high of these expectations is literally leading to relationship dissolution. Mm -hmm. So like, I expect everything as you, Maggie, as my relational partner, and like these people, these coworkers, these friends, they can't do anything, it's all up to you. I mean, that's a lot of responsibility, right? And if you like not have so much responsibility on me, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, but he talks about that, so I kind of wonder how, like, what he would say about the savior. I wonder if he's, like, that's more responsibility. So, like, not only do I have to, like, attend to you and enhance with you, but now I have to, like, get together and have savoring bonds with you. Like, this is a lot of requirement for our marriage. Okay, but seriously, you sound like it's going to be, some, like, some... <laughs> like, it's another to do Jacuzzi! Uh, yeah. Hippie, you know, intervention, you know, kind of thing. Like, we're going to do this, like, savoring weekend. And I think I could make some money doing that. So that yeah. could be my, you know. But I think that Maria Holmes, right? We have to have some kind of positive illusion within our relationship. Because that allows me to see. And I don't want, like, rose-colored glasses. But maybe, like, a little tiny, tiny little hint of something pinkish, right? Because it allows me to have that, that sort of relational world and be forgiving and to be, um, to, to continue to delight in my partner, you know, and for my partner to delight in me as we age and as we lose some of the value that we have in society and all of this. And I'm like, you know, partners are going to be a person who's like, you do this all the time, you're great. Yeah. Like, you just say that because that's what you think is really happening. But, you know, 
Um, so I think, you know, I, I think the positive illusions out of control, right, obviously put somebody too high in a pedestal and they're likely to just fall off. Mm -hmm. But that right around that right amount of positive illusion is really functional in a relationship and not fake news, right? Like this is like <laughs> this is this is a glow that you have in your heart. Um, I think you have to be careful. So within the military study that we're doing, we we are careful, um, you know, in, in the stimulus materials, right, to say that this isn't the research that's already out there in military companies, right? There's not a like you can't just call each other once a week or do whatever and everything. There's not one thing, but this is a tool that people can use um, that allows them to pay attention to the good stuff, right? Because so often we're trying to get to the we're trying to get to the good thing, but we're already in the good thing, so we can't necessarily see it. Yes. Some of this is stole first of I <laughs> <laughs> think of, a, of another thing. Fascinating. Um, really, really um, interesting. Thank you. Um, the thing that um, I, I noticed, and maybe, there, maybe I'm just missing it, but in terms of where people are experiencing the savoring, the workplace doesn't appear to show up. While I'm really savoring this experience, yeah. The email that Melissa sent me earlier, I didn't savor that so much. Sorry, just don't. No, Melissa Barnett. I didn't savor that. 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 But I was just curious that you had like a group experience. There were some group experiences. And of course, you're looking at people in the military, but it doesn't seem to be. Coming up in terms of how people are, you know, when they when they're talking about right. So in part, that's an artifact of, of the data because the data that we have examined most closely are among um, students here. Oh, okay. Where you see that though are sometimes in classroom experiences within aesthetic communication, right? So it could be um, a, and receiving praise and recognition. So the relational context there um, are sometimes teachers. Right? But you don't see the workplace appearing as much. And then, and then we ask very specific questions about within what relationships are you most, have you had the most savoring experiences and why? And tell us about that. And that usually starts with family, and it's because either I've spent most of my life with my family or because I am now far away from my family and I'm recalling these experiences. So in part, it's an artifact um, of, of these particular data, and I think that we will find more more workplace encounters, but they're not about the workplace. They're about the relationships within the workplace. And so there, there are. There's a beautiful one that is in an older adult data set that is a, 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 a male who talks about creating the perfect, um, the perfect needle. And it's beautifully written, but it's an aesthetic. It's, it's this aesthetic moment where he gets everybody, everybody's talking, you know, and enjoying each other's company. It's just like kind of a great, a great meeting. That can actually happen, right? And so we get it a little bit, but it's not. It's, it hasn't surfaced as often. Although the types of relationships within workplaces have a Oh, they have a link. And then societal, so big things, big events, sometimes stressful events where. The you know country's leader or whatever speaks. I think of a Churchill during World War II. Yeah. You know we'll fight him on the landed. So any of that, especially with I mean not the Churchill, but I mean just sort of the But the but those sort of um, shared experiences that are communication, but on a very broad level. Yeah, the ones that have come up, and I think you know I was lucky. As a graduate student, I was doing a research study um, of phenomenology with, with a team of researchers before 9-11. We continued that study after 9-11. And that was not unsavoring at all. It was about um, ex responses. It turned into responses to ways of, of coping with dealing with September 11th. We were um, and I was so lucky in that moment to have already been in in those data that we're having, and then this big event happened, how that shifts everybody's perception, mm -hmm. um, and immediate feelings of, of of closeness to somebody else, and almost that desperate need to to feel a relational um, bond. 
again, I, I would have to look closer probably at the, there, there is more variation in the older adult um, data. The ones that are more social oriented though, are still among the college students, and it has to do with things like on campus, like or maybe a concert, right, or a book fair, or some big event that's happening, but very, very much localized to the campus. But they have that experience of, or being with the crowd, and this was an implicitly shared one, being with the crowd um, and uh, summoning a, a peak of a volcano, and nobody's communicating. Um, and it's beautiful, so we know they're savoring because it's a beautiful moment, but what she was talking about was savoring the recognition that they were all having that same experience and they didn't need, and they couldn't. There are no words to put to this, and yet we're savoring this moment that we all share the same words or the same experience or whatever it is. We're communicating on this. So there are some group phenomena that, that happen, and those are falling down. Um, thank you so much, that's great. Um, I have a quick comment. Um, I love your meaning emphasis. Um, and the word meaning also reminds me of Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, where if you're not familiar, he, he wrote this book after about how he found meaning um, even being in a concentration camp. Um, and so to your question of like, what about people who are in horrible circumstances, I think savoring is a great way to find Actually, right. meaning. That's and, what I meant to and say. And thrive even in, like who would have thought you could thrive in a concentration camp, but you can through Yeah, yeah you have to. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, absolutely. I think me meaning to me was the, because, I mean, it sounds, it's pretty Pollyanna-ish when I come in and feel like, oh, there's a we're happy all the time. I've done also talks on campus where we talk about smiling a lot, and I get lots of smiles. I, I, I love it, right? But it, it kind of limits the things that I'm capable of doing when they have to do with smiling at all, saving these interactions. Um, it cannot just be about pleasant affect. It can't, because I, because I know, and, and as a phenomenologist, I can do these things. I know that I have savored, and I do savor, and I cherish grief. And cherishing that, if I didn't, I let go of that whole relationship. So I can embody those emotions and that experience, and I treasure it when I feel that that hurt, then I can put compassion and love toward that. Mm -hmm. And I like to bring it up, right? And I don't sit around, see, I'm not one of the people who's like, I don't, I don't, I'm not pessimistic, I'm not, like, I am not down in the dumps all the time, I'm not that person at all. But guess what? Sometimes I like to sit with that pain, I like to sit with that grief, and I like to sit with your pain and your grief. And if I can, if I can do that too, um, then I think that's an important contribution that that I, that I that I make, you know, in my own um, circles. And so I think the meaning part to me is an important part to put in. And once I once I started there, that's what moved me out culturally too, right? Because I thought um, we're not right. And the more you travel and, and you work, you know, within international populations mm -hmm. and languages. We're not all that there is, you know what I mean? And so I think it's really important for us to try to understand this from a different cultural angle. And recognizing too that older adults then are likely to savor um, a broader set of experiences, right? Because they also have had more life experiences, so they may bring those mm -hmm. meaningful ones in, which at the time maybe weren't savoring. Mm -hmm. But we also know that people who, who Really, on, on a deathbed or last conversations, holding somebody's hand and helping somebody transition out of this life. I talk about this for like mid midwifery, right? Like a midwife helps to bring the media, who hospice cares for workers, who help to facilitate that final goodbye. And, and there are really communicative moments there that you can savor in that, in that moment and, and, and make that. Also, you can just savor chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Sunshine on this day, which is beautiful. Thank you very much.